Hey guys, this is the second part of software development life cycle. Let's see what we got for today. Uh, we learned in the previous uh, lecture that software development development phases are seven, right? So we divided the whole process into seven phases. And we said planning is out of our scope. Uh, we talked about analysis. Now this time we want to talk about the design. So we will be talking about design for two sessions. Okay. So let's first change our hat from business analyst to designer or software architect. So what is the goal of design? You know, simply saying that it's just to un identify the classes, the responsibilities, which is also, you know, we are we, we know the responsibility as the interface or API of the class, right? But here we, we might say that you know the interface is very rigid thing yeah it's uh, you know it exposes the public methods those methods that are visible here we might be a little bit looking at the you know api as a, as a higher level i i try to explain that right but you know bottom line uh, we are looking for the interface or API of the uh, software, right? So identify classes, uh, identifying the responsibilities or the interface or the API. And also we would like to uh, find out the relationship between the classes. Okay, so three very high level uh, response, I mean, uh, the, you know, goal for the design would be finding the classes, finding the responsibilities, and finding the relationship between the classes. What is the artifact of this phase? Uh, we call it technical spec or technical specification. All right. So, what is technical specification? And probably the next question would be what is its ingredient so technical spec is an official document which describes the software components all of the parts of the software that are going to be designed and implemented we we will uh, put them in this technical spec we will see what do what we mean when we are saying that they you know software components so it is being written by software designer or software architect and it will be read by developers right so every phase every phase has one input and one output so the artifact that we input to design will be functional spec and the output would be the technical spec all right and the next phase would be implementation that's why we say that developers should be able to read the design document okay so now let's go inside the technical spec and with more detail look at them and see what's the ingredients of the technical spec so first of all we need to describe the problem so yeah we did this exactly for the functional spec as well so first we need to uh, tell the audiences of this document that okay what problem I'm gonna solve right so definitely we would need the problem 
uh, statement here. So it could be just the original problem statement, or possibly if the you know it is uh, clearer uh, the functional uh, you know the functional specs one is clearer than the original one. Definitely, you know it's better to uh, use that one. The more clear, the better, right? Okay. Also, it contains block diagram about software architecture. So what is, you know, what is this? I will cover that later. Yeah. So the whole software has a, a skeleton. It has a, an architecture, architecture, right? We need first to design that, that one, right? We will talk about in detail later. Also, it contains the uh, you know UML diagrams, and UML diagrams shows the first of all the classes and their relationship, and also more. There are more that we will see later. Okay, what else is inside the technical spec? The snapshots of the software UI. Right, so we put some mockups in the functional spec before. Yeah, we can copy them, or if we have more, you know clearer uh, mockups, uh, we can add them to to uh, in inside this technical spec. Okay, so here I just described a little bit bit more detail about the. Um, technical spec but for your term project I will give you a template that it has several places placeholders that you need to fill out so we'll see that later okay so you remember we said uh, uh, the goals of classes is identifying classes identifying the responsibilities or API and identifying the relationship between the classes right so now it's time to try to identify the classes the question is how can we identify classes okay so we read first of all we should read the functional spec when when, when i say we i mean we as the designer right so we read the functional spec and we have a rule of thumb that says we need to look for the nouns nouns in the functional spec are very good candidates for being classes so i am emphasizing about the candidates it means that there might be some nouns that are not suitable for being a class yeah we will see some examples later okay so let me summarize what i said we are going to identify classes from where from the functional spec we read the functional spec and especially when the you know it describing the uh, the problem and what we want to do uh, right so we look for the nouns and those are candidate for classes here is an example let's say we have uh, a voicemail system and inside the voicemail system functional spec uh, you know there are some nouns like this for example mailbox message user extension menu message queue yeah so these are uh, good candidates for uh, being classes now let me take a practical example a little bit more practical than this so let's say we have a, a vending machine and we want to simulate the operations of a vending machine and here is the you know whatever we have in the functional spec we want to read this carefully and 
you know, is recognize all of the those nouns that are good candidate for being classes. So we start from here. Product definitely is a good thing. Good, uh, I mean, candidate can be purchased and by inserting the correct number of coin is another one into the machine is the another one all right a customer is another one selects a product is already being recognized from a list of available products again adds coins uh, recognized before and either gets the product or gets the coins returned if insufficient money could be a candidate was supplied or if the product is sold out products uh, can be restocked and money removed by an operator you see all right so this is our list of the candidates for being classes right okay so i put the solution here for your reference all right so now the question is uh, what is the convention for naming the classes right so the classes should be a noun in singular form for example products no, we don't have that. We, we should not do that, right? We should not name our class as products or messages. Here are some uh, example, message, mailbox, employee, person, student, university. Yeah? These are good names for being classes. Sometimes we can add some adjective uh, as a prefix, right? For example, buffered reader rectangular shape these are uh, you know good names as well i mean they, they, these names are convenient in uh, the object oriented programming okay so we read the functional spec the description and we found the names but i want to say that this is not the case this is this is not always so simple. Sometimes it's very confusing. Sometimes, uh, you know, it's a vague thing and you cannot judge which one should be class, right? So uh, this is one example that if you, you're not so careful about picking the right names, you make a lot of mistakes. Let's say, well, you know, we we have a kitchen appliances application, and one part of that is processing the orders. So this application, uh, let's see. Um, so if you read the functional spec of that, probably you will you you will see some names. Uh, like this toasters blenders fridge oven right and if you just follow uh, the rule that we said nouns yeah you will end up with these classes toaster blender fridge oven no that's not the case it's not a good thing right these, these are too specific so if I say okay what is the best name for this, uh, you know, all of these uh, appliances, yeah, most likely you would say product. Yeah, that's correct. So product or let's say kitchen product to make it more, you know, um, more specific to this application. All right. Sometimes on the other side, uh, we, we might pick two general classes two general classes you know the names are too general here are some examples and we should avoid this one as well 
so not too specific and not too general so for example component is a very general name connection data network so these are very general probably if we mean you know database connection probably db connection is a better uh, you know candidate for the class name okay we are done with the identifying the classes now let's turn to identifying responsibilities how can we identify responsibilities so before going further responsibilities again uh, is a almost equivalent to API or interface but we might uh, look at these responsibility responsibilities uh, from a higher level right a higher level concepts right more than because AP when we say API it's uh, they are just methods name you know a specific methods name but when we talk about responsibilities here we are talking about a little bit higher level than the API which is a rigid thing right I will take some examples to clarify that so the question is we read the functional spec and how can we identify the responsibilities okay so we have a rule of thumb again but uh, this this time we are looking for verbs verbs in the functional spec or description of the the application is a good candidate for being responsibility of a class all right so here are some examples from the voicemail system again messages are recorded so recording a message is a responsibility right played it means that messages are played messages are deleted yeah so deleting a message it, it is a responsibility that we should take care of that all right or customers login so logging into the system is a responsibility that software should you know take care of that and you as the designer you should design that another one for example passcodes are checked so checking the passcodes all right so let's get back to our uh, familiar example that we took uh, before the vending machine and see how we can uh, identify the responsibilities all right so we read and try to find out so products can be purchased so purchasing a product is a responsibility by inserting inserting the correct number of coins so inserting coins inside the machine is another responsibility into the machine a customer selects so selects select what a product so selecting a product is another responsibility from a list of available products adds yeah adding coin is another responsibility and either gets the product so getting the product is another one or gets the coins return so this is another one if insufficient money was supplied so supplying is another one right so probably supplying money will be equivalent to adding right yeah we we can decide later or if the product is sold out so being sold out is another responsibility products can be restocked yeah restocking a product into machine and money removed removing money from the machine is another responsibility 
you see by looking into the description of the application and just uh, you know looking for the verbs we will have a list of very good candidates for being uh, you know being part of our uh, the applications api all right or classes api right all right so i put the solution for your reference here now let's see uh, what else we have for identifying responsibilities so let's say we identify the responsibilities now up to this point we have a list of the responsibilities and a list of the classes right but now the point is each responsibility belongs to a class right each responsibility should be should be uh, you know taken care of by only one class one and only one class right so our job is then to distribute and to figure out that these response you know each responsibility belongs to what class right okay so here is an example we have message queue right is a, is a class message queue so adding a message to the tail of the queue yeah so adding a message definitely goes to message queue remove yeah removing a message from the head of the queue so it goes to message queue class testing whether it is uh, you know empty or not it is, this is another uh, responsibility for this class all right okay so again it's not the case that it's always so easy sometimes very hard yeah so here is one example that sometimes we can be confused so we have message class and mailbox class and we want to add a message to a mailbox whose responsibility is to take care of this message class or mailbox class yeah sometimes actually this one is uh, you know easy but uh sometimes it's a little bit more confusing so the, this one yeah most likely it, it mail mailbox class is uh, should be in charge to add a message all right so i put uh, some exercises for you guys uh, so this is the list of the responsibilities and the list of the classes and your job is to uh figure out for example this responsibility uh, goes to which class you just you know name the class here something like that our next section is crc cards what is crc card first of all crc stands for class responsibilities collaborations okay so it is a technique it's an effective design technique that we can uh, refine the classes so we assume that we already uh, have the list of the classes and list of the responsibilities right so with this technique we will refine the classes and responsibilities and we find a class for each responsibility <clears throat> and we find the classes relationship as well so you see all of those uh, you know goals for the design you see we have here right uh, I, I actually accept the finding and uh, recognizing the uh, classes and responsibilities the rest of that so which is refining the classes and responsibility as i said they are not all of them uh, you know classes and responsibility we need they are just candidate we need now to refine them right anyway so let's see how it works so we uh, have some cards 
and each card describe one class. So each card of CRC contains these information, the name of the class, the, you know, its responsibilities and its dependencies, right? So also known as the collaborators. Okay, so dependency is something that I will introduce next in the next lecture. Uh, but as a you know very um, uh, superficial uh, idea, just know that uh, you know if a class to fulfill its job needs some other classes, we call this dependency. So that class has dependency to the other class, right? Okay. So now let's see how CRC cards work, right? So before going further, probably you are asking what 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 kind of card is this? It's just a card. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, you know, let's let's say you can use as index cards, which which is cheap and available, right? You can pass it around. Uh, yeah. So let's say that we are using the index cards. All right. Okay. So here is an example. So let's say we are focusing on the class login. So we put the name of the class here, and then we, you know, uh, divide the index card into two parts. On the left side, we put the responsibilities that belongs to this class, and on the right side, we the you know we mentioned the classes that uh, you know login would need them to fulfill its job all right so we call them dependencies for example if you want to log into a system probably the information of the username and password should come from somewhere right and this class job is to uh you know provide the data access so we, we call it data access layer let's say yeah all right okay so this was uh uh one crc card you would need uh, as many as classes you have and then you try to distribute the responsibilities so you can uh, put all of the class you know cards on on the table and then you have a list of the responsibilities and yeah you, you know you read one by one and say okay so this responsibility belongs to this class and then you can talk to your team and uh, you know you can have some some kind of collaboration and at the end of your meeting probably uh, and hopefully uh, your classes are, you know, discovered, and the responsibilities are discovered, and discover each each responsibility has, you know, belongs to a class, and you have also the relationship between the classes by uh, finding out which class has dependency to which class. All right. Okay. So all of this description that I gave here. Uh, I mentioned here for your reference. The only thing that I missed here is this one. So at the end, when your job is done, and when you identify, I mean, uh, you know, uh, every every responsibility, ha you know, belongs to a class, and you know that right now, and you you discovered all of the relationship between the classes now you don't need the you know crc cards anymore you can discard them and you can uh, you know throw them away because this you know crc cards are not an official thing it's just a middleware tool to help you to uh, you know finish your design stuff all right so it's not part of the technical spec you can discard them okay now let me ask a couple of questions regarding the design uh, is choosing the algorithm a design concern the software architect should choose the algorithm for you as the developer no no way 
it's, it's implementation concern, right? Another question can be choosing the data structure is the design concern? No, again, it's implementation concern, right? How about choosing the programming language? Programming language, in theory, is not uh, design concern, yeah, in theory. But in practice, in uh, you know, it affects, right? So, but if you want to respond, uh, you know, professionally, we would say, no, in theory, design should be independent of programming languages. So you design, you spend some time to design a software, and then uh, let's say uh, your client uh, mind is changed and say, okay, no, now I want to use, let's say, uh, C sharp instead of the Java, or I want to use C++. Well, actually, that's not a good idea, but yeah, <laughs> Java is better, definitely. <laughs> but yeah, just as a you know joke. Uh, Anyway, uh, yeah, so in the practice, um, yeah, it affects the design procedure. All right. Okay, some notes. Uh, we usually have a starting class. Let's call it main, main class. So in Java, let's say we, we create a main Java class whose job is to start the application okay so there is a, a hidden tendency in some people to make this starter uh, class a big and fat class a very big and and you know almighty it's omnipotent class so don't do that the uh, starting class is just a starter its job is just you know initializing initializing something so reading the config file uh, and you know initializing the uh, those uh, parameters that you want and then running the application so yeah i am telling you these uh, you know symptoms that i have seen um, you know a lot between the students between my colleagues uh, even when I was, you know, very young, probably. Uh, anyway, so don't do that. The next, the next point of the, uh, you know, class is, you know, ideally, every class should have a single purpose. Yeah, you design a class for just one purpose, high-level purpose, right? Sometimes we use the you know single responsibility, but you shouldn't confuse between this responsibility and the API responsibilities of a class that uh, is almost equivalent to API, almost, right? So every class should have one single purpose and this is a golden rule of design we will get back to this because it's a very important thing later i will uh, you know have some lecture about the you know this golden rule all right and also you need to know that it is impossible to recognize all classes and responsibilities in one step it is almost impossible right so the discovery process is an iterative thing right you find and refine the uh, the classes and responsibilities and then after a while you would need to review that and this you know is going to continue uh, for you know as long as uh, the application is alive and you want to enhance it or maintain it and so forth right so Discovering this process is, you know, iterative. Just uh, keep in your mind. And also, classes and their relationship and the, you know, the structure of the classes, you know, change a lot, many, many times. And in this is not just for the, uh, you know, entry level uh, developer. No, this is not the case. For even experienced 
engineers or developers you see this will happen okay and the last point that i want to mention here is that we need to spend you know more time on design i know that in some uh, you know students or even some people developers uh, they just start you know uh, you know they sit at their desk and start uh, coding without thinking uh, that, that uh, you know uh, about the what structure this uh, software is going to have and you know no design at all no, they don't write anything on the paper at all so that's not a good habit i am telling you so this is not the case that always the number of classes is four or five yeah some you know, most of the time in the you know in the real uh, project there are thousands of the classes yeah so you should you know change your habit to spend more time for designing in this section i'm gonna give you some rules and criteria that you know if you want to uh, design a class and this class leaves for a long time don't die you know doesn't die and also if you want to your class looks good so this section is for you all right so we want to talk about the quality of class interface right how uh, you know what criteria we should follow to make our class to you know look good and live for a long time all right we we are going to talk about five c's and these five c's is one step for being a good designer we will have some other things that yeah, you know we will cover later but as a uh, you know introduction of uh, improving the quality of the interfaces or api uh, we mentioned five c's what, what are these five c's first the cohesion uh, completeness convenience clarity and consistency okay so let's start with the cohesion from etymology point of view the definition of the uh, cohesion if you look it up in the you know a dictionary uh, so you say the act or state of sticking together tightly yeah so when we say something is cohesive we means that you know it has a you know clear boundary and all of the parts are located in one place and nothing more it doesn't it does not have some extra thing for example a ball right the ball everything it needs it has right but if you let's say put a clock on on, on it it's totally unnecessary <laughs> right so then we cannot say that this ball is a cohesive object all right so we have the same thing for the classes class should be single purpose we saw this uh, you know in the previous uh, slides yeah i said we will get back to this so this is one of them we will get back again to this single purpose later right so the cohesion we call a class cohesive if it has only one purpose it is designed for only one purpose nothing more it focuses on on single purpose okay so if we add some other purposes to a to a class we are violating the cohesion uh, rule all right all right so let me take an example here let's say we have a class foo and this class foo is you know doing its job but now we need to connect to database 
for you know let, let's say we enhanced class foo now it needs to connect to the database right so we have two scenario here the first scenario no problem no problem you just add some methods that uh, fulfill the connection to the database yeah yeah definitely it's not a good idea this is a violation of cohesion so not a good idea the second scenario would say okay let's create a new class for this you know a specific purpose connecting to database let's call it db connection yeah definitely this is a better idea right so if you want to uh, you know follow the cohesion and you, if you want to have cohesive classes just design your classes with a single purpose all right another parameter or another rule is completeness right when we, we can say something is complete when there it doesn't have you know it it does not lack anything right if it is complete it means that it's do, doing its job perfectly everything it needs it has right so if a class does not support all of those responsibilities that you know we intended right then we would say it is not complete otherwise it is complete you know it, it follows the completeness rule right so it should not lack anything right let me take an example so let's say message queue is a class and it is supposed to maintain the messages right so what we do we expect that this message queue uh, you know have we expect that you know all of those things that is uh, you know required for a queue a data structure queue it should have for example n queuing or d queuing or checking that the queue is empty or not right so if this message queue has all of these things that it should then we would say yeah we design a complete class or this class is complete right if it lacks something for example if it doesn't have is empty how can we check that a queue is empty right yeah there is some you know techniques to do that but it's not appropriate for example if you want to uh, find out that the queue is is empty let's say dequeue it and say whether it is uh, giving you a value or not then you should return back that value to that queue right that's totally inappropriate right so the class message queue we expect that it does all of these stuff by itself all right so in that case we would say the class is complete so this is the second parameter for, for being a good design the third one is convenience you your user should be able to use your api your classes api very easily it should be easy to use right so probably you don't remember java 7 yeah java, when java 7 came then uh, date and gregorian calendar you know to use these two classes was a, a chaos and also reading and writing to a text file it was a chaos yeah yeah just research for uh, you know this i don't want to mention here uh, and confuse you yeah but if you look at that how you can use these guys and you will see that what, what what i am talking about so the api should be designed in such a way that it, you know easily you should just you know by passing something and uh, you know get the, the service that you are looking for the next one is 
clarity. So what does it mean? It means that your interface, class interface or API should not be confusing. What does it mean? Let me take an example. So for example, if you have, uh, let's say, two methods with the same name, but they are doing this, you know, different things, right? This is, this is not acceptable. Or maybe you have some strange names that is not along with the purpose of that method. Something like my method, it's, it doesn't make sense, right? So we would say that if you confuse the programmers, they produce buggy codes, right? So when you design something and another developer is going to use that, do not confuse them. That's, that's the point. If you confuse them, they will produce buggy codes. All right. So, and the last C is consistency. So everything in your uh, class should be consistent. You know, all of the operations should be consistent. Even the, you know, when you are naming, uh, the, you know, the methods or the variables, be consistent about those namings as well, right? Let me take an example here, a very famous example about the Gregorian calendar, right? It had this constructor. You could create a Gregorian calendar to manipulate the time and date by this constructor. But the funny things about this constructor was about the month and the day. The month started from 0 to 11, but the day started from 1 to 31. Why should we do that? This, this inconsistency in two parameters is not acceptable at all. Okay, now let's uh, summarize what we said. So we talked about five C's, cohesion, completeness, convenience, clarity, and consistency. And from time to time, uh, you know, when you are thinking about, you know, these guys, in some cases, there might be some conflict. You want to keep the cohesion. Maybe you, you, you know, you, you might lose the, let's say, clarity or something. Yeah. Actually, I don't have any uh, good example right now in my mind, but, uh, you know, just expect that this would happen later. So how can we resolve that? It depends on your judgment, yeah? You need to use your judgment and make a balance between uh, all of these five parameters. Okay, now the question is, what benefits we get when we use these five Cs so far? You know, based on our current knowledge, uh, we can say that if we use these five C's in our classes and our, in our design, uh, you know, we increase the readability of the code. Because, you know, we, we, we said many things about that, uh, you know, simplify everything, it should be consistent. So it makes the understanding of the code easier. And when uh, the understanding of the code is easier, then it means that it is readable. You increase the readability of the code. And when a, a code can be readable and understandable quickly, it is maintainable. So you are increasing the maintainability, right? And also we talked about the single purpose, right? Uh, in the cohesion, you, we are increasing the reusability of the classes. And when we have all of this, we increase the testability of the classes. So if a class can be tested easily, it means that it, 
you know, it lives for a long time because all of the bugs will be discovered quickly, right? That's the importance of the testability. All right. So with these five C's, actually, we increase four very important parameters of software engineering. So that's what I had. So see you guys in the next lecture.